hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, my name is Jan, and I will now, in the next 50, 55 minutes, I will talk about Quarkus. Um, first, let's talk a little bit about me, who I am. I'm a software engineer working at Red Hat. Uh, I kind of love Java and open source stuff. I used to work on Wildfly and Deed, which is uh, uh, for vir data virtualization. Right now, my main focus is Quarkus itself and MicroProfile. So mostly the, the work I do is in integrating MicroProfile implementations into, into Quarkus. Uh, and in particular, I focus on MicroProfile metrics, which you saw uh, who was here on the previous presentation. You saw a little bit about MicroProfile metrics. You will see it again in this presentation. Uh, another thing that I do is Hocular metrics, which is an old monitoring solution uh, in OpenShift 3. Uh, other than that, it's just a little bit about me. Uh, I'm a traveler, father, whatever. Let's go on. Uh, so uh, let's now talk about Quarkus. What is it? Uh, Quarkus is a, is a platform. It's a platform for developing Java-based applications, mostly but not limited to microservices. Uh, so, uh, uh, what, what does it, what does it do? What is it? Why is it so awesome? Um, what, what, what makes? How does it make a difference to to all the older frameworks that that like that implement Java EE and so on? Well, these are the main goals that I see as I see as important for Quarkus. The main goals that Quarkus how Quarkus tries to make your the development of your Java microservices awesome. Uh, it brings you uh, developer joy. It kind of uh, resolves some issues that people usually um, see in, in Java, as the, uh, in Java language as general. Um, it puts all your fa favorite frameworks, uh, uh, frameworks under one platform. Uh, you, can see, you can use MicroProfile. You can use Jakarta EE. And, and use any other kind of framework if you write uh, an extension for it, or maybe even without an extension. Uh, it's blazing fast. Uh, it, it, what it does, how does it achieve blazing fast startup is a, a thing called build time initialization. I'll talk about it in a bit. Uh, it integrates with Grow VM, so it allows you to, to be even faster by uh, compiling your uh, application into a native binary. It's cloud native, suitable for all cloud environments, including serverless. It unifies imperative and reactive programming, so you can use both in, in any project and combine them however you like. And it also, apart from Java, it supports uh, more languages, JVM languages. Uh, for now, it's Kotlin and Scala. Well, uh, let's now dive into each of these goals a little bit further. So the first, first goal, and I would say one of probably the most important, at least for me, is developer joy. Well, uh, one of the main issues people have with Java, and especially enterprise Java, is that uh, the development is slow. Development is slow because um, you have to recompile everything, repackage, redeploy, and that just takes a lot of time. If you ever worked with Wildfly, uh, so you must remember that if you want to redeploy your application, you have to run Maven package. It produces a package that takes like 10 seconds. Then you have to uh, redeploy the application that's another five seconds or so. It just takes a lot of time. Well, with Quarkus, this is solved. We have the thing called live development or development mode, uh, which allows you to uh, reload the application on, in blink of an eye without uh, hitting, uh, without doing any compilation yourself. It basically uh, compiles the application uh, itself on the, in the background. Uh, so it kind of feels like it feels like you're coding PHP, ex except it's Java. It feels like uh, scripting language because everything just uh, any changes 
just apply themselves automatically and super fast. Uh, you will see uh, in the demo. Uh, so, uh, what frameworks can you use when you decide to use Quarkus platform? Well, uh, we support already uh, a lot of the usual frameworks that people who use Java, they normally know these frameworks like, like MicroProfile uh, and Jakarta EE. Well, we support a reasonable subset of Java, Jakarta EE. Not everything, there's no EJBs and stuff, but there is, of course, CDI, there is JPA. Um, from MicroProfile, that's mostly about observability, fault tolerance and all that stuff. You can use REST easy, and you can basically use any kind of framework. Uh, if you, uh, uh, if there's an extension for it, then great. If there is no extension, perhaps you can use it even without that extension, but maybe uh, you can even write your own extension for your framework, because Quarkus <coughs> is designed to be very extensible. Um, another goal that Quarkus achieves is uh, imperative and reactive programming unified. So uh, here you have two examples. One is classic imperative uh, style programming, and that's a REST service. That's, I think everybody understands what it, what it does. It, it is a REST endpoint that kind of uh, returns a message, and it's written in, in an imperative way. If we want to do reactive programming, you can uh, do something like this you can turn that endpoint into an endpoint that produces server sent events. And from your method, you just return basically a, a publisher, publisher of strings, and you connect that publisher using, using a microprofile reactive messaging or something else uh, to, uh, to a source of messages. And each message that arrives will be sent to the client uh, you can use uh, both of these approaches and combine them however you like. Um, if you're interested more in, the, uh, in more details about the reactive programming thing, um, we here tomorrow, 2.30, there will be a presentation by Martin Stefanko uh, specifically about reactive programming with microprofile. Okay, and now, Let's have a look at the so-called build time initialization. It's one of the, also one of the cool, uh, cool features of Quarkus because it allows you to start your application really, really fast. Um, and we achieve that by moving part of uh, the initialization into build time. How does that work? Well, normally what frameworks do at startup time, uh, well, traditional Java frameworks, uh, when you start booting your application, they have to parse your configuration files, validate or injection points, scan the class path for annotations, build some meta models, whatever. Uh, and that's a lot of work that takes usually a, a few seconds. Well, with Quarkus, we, uh, we have a way to move most of this to, uh, not to runtime, but to build time. So it is performed at build, and you will see uh, a bit more about how it works in a bit. And so the build will take a little bit more time than usual, but after that, uh, the application will start very, very fast, uh, as you will see also in the demo in the second half of the, of the presentation. Uh, yeah, uh, another advantage to this is that you can catch even more errors at compile time than usual. Well, Java in general is a language where a lot of programmer errors can be uh, caught at compile time. Well, uh, with Quarkus, you uh, can catch even more errors because you don't catch only the, let's say, Java language errors from the perspective of Java but you also catch errors from the perspective of the frameworks that you use. Because basically at build time, uh, you not only 
compile your source code. It basically also kind of runs the application. So if the, if, if the application fails to start, you will see it at build time. And, and you will not have to uh, wait to, to catch that error at, at the runtime. So if you, prob if you for example, have a, a CDI injection point which uh, is, not, it doesn't, is not satisfied, then the application will not be able to build and, and you will not have to wait until runtime to get, er the, to get the runtime error. Uh, so uh, most of these things, like parsing the config files, scanning the annotations, uh, everything that I, I listed here, that's done at build time. Um, the result of, these, of the, the scanning and validation is basically ser serialized into your application as, as the so-called recorded bytecode. Um, and then when your application starts, uh, just the recorded bytecode, which is highly optimized, will be executed. Um, this has also another advantage. The bootstrap classes that do this, parsing the config files and er everything, these classes which perform this task can be discarded after, after the build, so we don't have to use them at all during runtime, which again makes uh, your application uh, even lighter in terms of both the CPU usage and, uh, and memory usage. Mm. What's the effect on the startup time? Well, there, here are some numbers, some, some wild numbers. Uh, how much does it take, how, how long does it take to start uh, a, a regular uh, a microservice that contains a REST endpoint and some, a bit of more, some more stuff? Well, with traditional cloud native stacks, like, I don't know, Spring Boot, or something like this, it could take around four seconds, let's say. Well, with Quarkus, you, uh, if you use uh, G, the Quarkus in the JVM mode, you get it down to less than one second. I think it can be even less than 0 0.9. And if you want to be even faster and you use the native mode with GraalVM, uh, your application will start absolutely blazing fast in really a matter of milliseconds or tens of milliseconds. So I think that's pretty amazing. Uh, so let's, uh, let's have a b look at what the, what the bytecode recording is because build time initialization is based on this. So uh, at build, uh, all the relevant configuration files uh, are read, uh, application is scanned for annotations, all the meta model is, uh, is constructed and validated. Well, and um, as, um, the code, the, the necessary code the, to, to actually start your application is recorded. This is called bytecode byte code recording. Uh, I will see, you, we will see right here, yeah. This is an example. Uh, um, for example, if I, I told you I will, I, will speak, I will speak about metrics. So for example, if you have a class with, uh, that uses microprofile metrics, I have a class that, uh, that contains two annotations for, uh, about metrics, um, which means uh, you, uh, this means that uh, each of these methods, method one and method two, each one of them will have attached a counter, and that means if the method is called, uh, the counter will be incremented, so you can then uh, monitor how, how often your, your methods are, uh, are called. Okay, so uh, bytecode recording. Uh, at build time, Quarkus platform scans scans your class for these annotations, for these metric annotations, and turns your class that looks like this into recorded bytecode, which looks like this. So it scans 
uh, it finds the two annotations and uh, produces some uh, kind of bytecode. Uh, if it produces a, a class, it's a regular Java class, uh, in, uh, it's compiled, and if you decompile it, this is generated code, yeah? So, but if you de decompile the code, uh, the class that is generated, you might see something similar to this. You might see that there's a, something like a deploy method the, which just does all the necessary things that, that are necessary to, uh, to start your application to uh, have your metrics registered. So it kind of creates a metric registry, then it creates some necessary metadata objects for, for the metrics, and, and registers the metrics in the registry. So uh, at startup, all just, just this code is, uh, is executed. Um, so it's kind of fast because you don't have to rescan the annotations. They were scanned at build time. Now at runtime, you just you just run the recorded bytecode, which looks like this. So uh, it will be very fast. Well, uh, and there's a difference uh, between JVM mode and the native mode. In in JVM mode, uh, this will be executed as soon as you start uh, as you are starting your application. Uh, your, your jar, this is, uh, uh, the contents of this class will just be executed as nor normally, it will, it will be called and executed. Uh, if you use the native mode, if you uh, package your application into a native binary, uh, it gets even better because uh, the result, of basically, of executing this is, uh, is serialized during build time, it is serialized into, into the native binary itself. So it kinda, when you execute this code at build time, it produces some, some tree of, of, of Java objects. Um, with ground VM, when producing a native binary, you can s basically serialize the, uh, these ready constructed initialized objects into the binary itself. So when you start, uh, when you start the, the, uh, the binary, uh, it just uh, reads, reads uh, the state of these initialized objects straight into your memory. It doesn't have to reinitialize them again. So that's why it's really, really fast. So yeah, I, I basically already talked about this uh, Native compilation, or, or sometimes it's called ahead of time compilation. We use Graal VM for that. Uh, it produces a native uh, nat uh, platform dependent code. We, of course, support Linux and Windows mostly. Um, it it uh, also pr uh, does some very ag aggressive optimizations and dead code elimination. Uh, which brings itself some caveats for usage. I, I will talk about them uh, soon. Yes. And uh, the native compilation takes a few minutes. It's, it's a bit slower than the normal compilation because it really produces very aggressive optimizations. But once, once you finish it and you produce that binary, uh, you, as I said, it will start very fast. So it will be, let's say, very suitable for, for serverless environments, especially where there's a requirement that the, that the, uh, that the application needs to start very, very fast. Uh, let's have a look at the also memory, memory footprint. Uh, well, this uh, build time initialization and Graal VM usage doesn't only uh, speed up your startup, it also reduces the memory footprint. So uh, another set of numbers, well, uh, how much memory does, is being used when you run a, a regular application with, uh, with a REST endpoint and some CRUD operations for an, for an entity? Well, with a traditional stack, uh, which would be, again, something like Spring Boot, Thorntail, Wildfly, let's say somewhere more than 200 megabytes. Well, with Quarkus, in JVM mode, you get to 
130, you can cut it about in half. And if you use native compilation, it's even, even much better. In, in this case, let's say 35 megabytes. Okay, now uh, let's talk a bit more about the application boot. Um, how, it, how it works, um, the bytecode recording, um, there are two types of bytecode recorders, uh, static in it and runtime in it. Um, the difference is uh, how they uh, behave in native mode and in JVM mode. Well, in native mode, uh, the results of static in it um, recorders are, are, as I already talked about it, are serialized straight into the native binary. That's where you produce objects, and these objects, ob object tree is serialized in straight into the binary, so when you run your application, uh, you just uh, uh, read these objects into, into the memory. Uh, there's, but there's a runtime in it, phase, which is uh, for, um, uh, for the byte code, recorded bytecode that cannot be serialized into the native binary for some reason. Of course, you cannot uh, serialize stuff like uh, opening, uh, opening network sockets, for example or some IO, IO, operations that, IO operations that are necessary while starting your application, or running threads. All of this will be done in runtime init phase, uh, which is in native mode uh, after your application is, when your application is starting. Well, when your uh, application is starting, you get the, the results of static init, you get straight in, in from your binary, just just read into the memory, and then runtime init operations are, are executed normally. So that starts uh, application threads, uh, binds n networking interfaces, and stuff like that. In JVM mode, uh, both static and runtime init uh, bytecode executes at, at boot time, because there's no way how to serialize live objects into, into a JAR file. Java doesn't. Java doesn't support that. Um, if you'd like to learn more about this, uh, be sure to visit the workshop uh, by Mat uh, Matej Novotny and uh, Martin Koba on Sunday at half past 11. It will be about writing your first supersonic extension for Quarkus. So they will definitely talk about bytecode byte code recording, which is one of the main things that Quarkus extensions have to do. Okay, uh, now a little bit about the, the limitations, because this is all, uh, all awesome, of course. If you uh, package your application into a native binary that starts r really freaking fast, there has to be some downsides to this. Well, yes, there are. There are some s things that are just not supported in, in native mode because they are not supported by Graal VM by design. Well, one of the most important, one, one of these things is dynamic class loading. Well, because your classes or your bytecode is uh, compiled into na in, from bytecode into native, native code, uh, it's impossible to, at runtime, to dynamically load more classes because they're just, their bytecode is just not compiled in, in the binary, is not present there, so you cannot uh, execute that dynamically loaded code. You can't use the security manager. Well, but that's probably not uh, that much of an issue because the security, Java security manager is usually used for sandboxing untrusted code that you dynamically load into your uh, runtime. Well, and you don't dynamically load anything into your runtime, so you probably don't need a Java security manager. Another thing that's not supported is uh, JMX. Uh, you also can't use things like finalizers, and, and plain Java serialization is not supported either. Um, there are some things which are supported, but with some caveats, like reflective operations. I have an example here. This will work uh, 
of always. If you access a field named bar of a class named foo, and you access it in this way, it will work because uh, during the compilation, GraalVM will be able to, to see that you are uh, accessing this exact field. So it will be able to um, uh, add the reflective metadata of the class into, uh, add it into the, into, the, uh, into the binary. If you do something like this, where uh, the field that you access is not a constant, it's a variable that can change over time, uh, then GraalVM doesn't know that which fields you will be using reflectively, so it might happen that this will not work. Um, but you can solve this, you can explicitly tell GraalVM that uh, all uh, reflective metadata of this class has to be uh, serialized, included in, in, the, in your binary. So. Uh, uh, you can tell GraalVM that the full class uh, should fully support uh, reflective operations. This can be controlled by GraalVM arguments. If you are writing an extension for Quarkus, uh, the Quarkus, uh, uh, ex like say, extension API ha has ways to control this. So you can, your extension can declare that uh, these classes be, will be used reflectively. Um, similar to reflective operations is uh, dynamic proxies. For, dyna for proxies to work, GraalVM kind of needs to know in advance during build time uh, the, the complete list of interfaces that your proxies will uh, implement. If GraalVM is unable to reason about this, then uh, you will at runtime get, uh, get an error. But this, this can also be controlled using, uh, uh, using GraalVM arguments. Um, one thing that surprised me a few uh, uh, weeks ago when I was writing an extension was that all static initializers are executed eagerly. Well, obviously, if you, uh, uh, if you initialize your classes and serialize the result into, into a binary, uh, of course, it runs all static initializers. Well, that's, uh, uh, that, has, that needs to be done. Uh, but if this causes problems for some reason in your application, you can control this. You can say that uh, some specific classes should be initialized at, at uh, runtime, not at build time. Um, one more thing uh, which might get a little bit problematic is debugging. Well, of course, if your application is no longer running uh, with a regular, as a regular JVM process, you can't use normal Java debuggers. You can use the general debuggers like JDB and whatever. Uh, there's one problem to it, uh, that if you want to include debugging uh, symbols in your, in your binary, you need the uh, GraalVM Enterprise Edition. And now, uh, enough slides, let's get to the demo. Okay, so um, I will now um, show you how to build a full-fledged application. Um, that application will, or what will it contain? It will contain a REST, REST endpoint. Uh, it will have uh, Hibernate entities. Uh, it will have uh, microprofile metrics. Uh, and if there are entities, of course, that means accessing the database, so we will also use a database. Let's get to it. Uh, so first, I will, I will start uh, the database so we have something to run against. Uh, I will run the Postgres database uh, in, in a Docker container. I will use this. Here, so we have a, a running Postgres database. Um, and now let's start a, a brand new um, project. How to start a new Quarkus project? Well, there are several options. One option is that you can use this website called Quarkus.io. 
maintained by our, our team, um, where you basically uh, choose your uh, Maven, uh, Maven artifact coordinates for your application. You also choose whether it should be Maven or Gradle. We support both. And then you can choose the list of uh, Quarkus extensions that you are uh, going to use. You can, you see, there's all, all of their necessary stuff. Hibernate, J JDBC drivers, MongoDB, re reactive stuff, Apache Kafka, JMS, Vertex. There's a, a lot of things and you just uh, pick which ones you want and then after you pick your Maven coordinates and your uh, extensions, you click generate and it will generate a zip file for you, which if you unzip that file, it contains a POM XML or old build Gradle and with all the necessary scaffolding that you need to, to start with your application. Well, but I will not do this now. I will uh, use a different approach. I will use our, our uh, Maven plugin. Let's, uh, okay, Maven plugin. Uh, we have a Maven plugin that allows you to create uh, Quarkus um, uh, projects. So I will run that plugin, the create goal. And, and now it asks me about some things like the Maven coordinates, of course. Uh, let's leave everything at the default. We want to create a, a REST resource. In this case, I will say yes. And everything else sh I will leave as default. So with this, this call, uh, it generated some scaffolding necessary to, uh, to get a project up and running. Now I can open that in my IDE. I will open it in my IDE. Uh, it will also include a simple readme file to show you how to run your application in, in dev mode, in regular JVM mode, and in native mode, all of it. You can see there's a POM XML that declares uh, some, uh, some ba basic things that you need to, 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 uh, to develop with Quarkus. Well, and now the application is basically ready to be started. So I can now show you the um, live reloading features of, of the development mode. If you run the Go Maven Quarkus dev, it will start your application in development mode, which means uh, that any changes that you do in your sources will immediately trigger a reload of the application. So uh, here it generated this, this REST resource for me. So uh, I see that there is a REST resource on the path hello that should just return hello. Let's let's give it a try using curl localhost 8080 uh, slash hello. Yeah, you see. And it says hello. Um, now let's just um, let's just ch change something. Uh, let's add some exclamation marks. Uh, I and now I just try it again and. Everything is applied. The changes are applied, and now I get hello with exclamation marks. What, what, what would happen if I introduced some sort of syntax error? Something like this. Well, you, uh, the application will run still, but when you, uh, when you do curl, you, you send a request, you will get an error. And it will say that, yeah, that yeah, hey man, you have a, a syntax error there. So let's fix that for now. And let's start with something more in, in, interesting now. Uh, now I will use the, the Maven plugin to add some extensions that I will need for my, to build my application. So I will, 
I will add extensions. Uh, extensions, um, I will add Hibernate ORM with Panache. You will see what Panache is in a bit. Uh, I will be accessing a Postgres database, so I will also include JDBC Postgres SQL extension. Rest easy JSON B is for serializing some objects uh, or, or to JSON. We will need that as well. So uh, I run that. Oh no, I'm in the wrong directory, sorry. Well, what it did basically is that it just uh, added some dependencies in my Palm XML. You can, of course, uh, do it the regular way that you manually uh, add your dependencies to the, to the POM. But it's also one of the ways to do this is to, use, is, is to use the Maven plugin for this. I decided to use the Maven plugin in this case. But you can, you can add your dependencies the normal way manually into your POM. OK. Uh, by the way, uh, it picked up. Uh, a change in the POM, so it reloaded immediately. You don't even have to change source code of your application. It also reloads and when it detects changes in the POM, X, POM XML. So uh, it, Quarkus reloaded my application, and uh, I see it started again, and, that, and it, it, there's a log during the startup which uh, tells you what, what features you have installed so now now it includes all the tag things that I just added using the maven plugin uh, this is not on Graal VM this is uh, this is with open JDK I will show the Graal VM example later okay uh, now so let's access the database uh, to access a database you need some configuration of, of course um, well, Quarkus has uh, this uh, approach to configuration that there's just one property file that, con that contains all configuration uh, keys and values that your application will need. Uh, it's the it's application properties located in uh, source, uh, source main resources. Um, so it also generated a, a blank application properties for me and now I added some configuration for uh, that I will be I will be needed for um, connecting to the database so I will use the Postgres driver there's the JDBC URL username password and and for for hibernate uh, I will tell that each time the application is reloaded the schema in the database should be uh, dropped and recreated, this, which is quite useful for development purposes. Of course, this is a nonsense in a production, as you might imagine. Uh, now, let's uh, create an entity. I will create a, a class, person. Let's have a class named person, and it will be an entity. It's, generally, it's a Java Express Systems Entity, just regular JPA API. But we will spice it up a little bit. We will use Panache. Panache is a, a special, let's say, extension to Hibernate that we support in Quarkus. Uh, uh, it, it will allow you to do, to do some interesting magic that you will see shortly. I do that by extending, just extending uh, the, the class Panache Entity. That's an abstract class that you can extend. Now, my entity will need a name, just, just name in this case. Uh, you might see uh, I'm doing maybe a little weird thing. I'm, I'm having a field that's public. Well, of course, you can uh, use the, the, let's say, more usual approach where where you would use a property with and the field itself would be private and we have a getter and setter and this is just to show you that you can if you want uh, also do it this way it it just makes the code shorter uh, and Quarkus will will understand this uh, now I so I have a entity for persons now let's uh, add um, uh, a REST method that will add new uh, persons into the database. So 
I just copied this. Yes, uh, so it's a post method that produce, uh, that takes uh, a name, create slash name, and the name is a, is a path parameter, and what it does, it creates a person, sets its name, and, and then persists it into the database. You might see, uh, that might be quite surprising, that I'm not injecting any entity manager or something like that. Well, with Panache, I don't need to use an entity manager. It's embedded, it's handled for me. If I use Panache, by extending the Panache entity, uh, I immediately get uh, my, uh, a lot of interesting and useful methods for my, for my entity classes. So you can see there's a lot of static methods for, for example, finding, finding, uh, finding uh, uh, instances of that entity find all, find by ID, listing, streaming, and all that stuff. Uh, and for that, you just don't need to uh, play with your um, entity manager. You just use your class itself. So let's uh, give this a try. I will now create a person. Create a person named Joe. And yeah, it needs to be post. It now created a person named Joe. Okay, uh, let's create another REST method that uh, gets, gets a person by name. You can see I, I'm using the static method find or that I received uh, on the on the person class by extending Panache entity. Uh, so I can say that I want to find a person and find the person where uh, the field called name is equal to name. And the name is a zip path parameter for, uh, for my REST method. So let's uh, try to retrieve Joe. Uh, hello, instead of create, I will call get get Joe, and it will be a get request. Uh, what happened here? No entity. Yeah, of course. Uh, um, it reloaded in the meantime because I changed something in the code. And because I configured Hibernate to drop and create with each reload, my entity got lost, so I will have to create it again. So I will create again Joe, and now I can get Joe. And now, uh, now you see it retri uh, I retrieved a person with ID one, uh, that ID is uh, a field that is just um, provided to me automatically. Uh, I didn't have to specify uh, the ID. It's provided automatically. Of, of course, if you want, you can designate your field as the, as the primary key. Uh, but if you don't, uh, you get an ID field generated automatically. Okay, uh, now another method that will retrieve all persons. Hello, resource. Now we will use another uh, method that it's on the path all, and it calls the static method find all. It's again uh, panache, the, our extension to, high, uh, to, to JPA API, and, and this will return it as a list and send it to the client. So, of course, I will have to create Joe again, and maybe Alice. And now I can get, get all the persons. I can see that it now returned to two persons. Okay. Um, uh, we're kind of running out of time, so I'll try to speed it up. Uh, yeah. I wanted to show you metrics, but I think I don't quite have time for that. I will show you uh, the more important thing, and that is the native, uh, native mode. So uh, I, I just stopped the Quarkus development mode by just stopping the, the, the Maven execution of Maven Quarkus dev. Now I will, uh, yeah, I have to remove the generated test because I, I think I, I broke it, it would not pass. Um, now, if I want to uh, generate a, a native uh, native package of my of my application, 
I do Maven package with the uh, native uh, system property specified. So now, what it now it's basically calling GraalVM. You see, it's executing GraalVM and its native image uh, utility, and you can see the uh, it's. The, the application is really kind of starting, kind of, not fully starting at build, but uh, uh, it, it's needed to start the application and initialize it, and when most of the application is started and initialized, then that uh, initialized state will be uh, serialized into, into the native binary. So this, uh, for this simple application, will take about a minute or something like that, so I, I think it should be ready quite soon, I hope. Let's wait a bit. Uh, it does some aggressive optimizations, uh, dead code elimination, uh, and em embeds every all, all the necessary metadata in, and into the into the application so that you will see how, how you can run your application very fast. It should be finished very soon. Come on, come on. This obviously takes a bit more time than, than the normal build, but once you build it, you will see how fast it, it gets. And it's done. It's, so it took almost two minutes. Uh, in generated uh, f in the target directory, we now have a. Uh, yeah, that's the that's that's the that's what it produced. It, you can really see that it's an executable for for Linux. Um, and if you if you run that, uh, it says that the application started in 34 milliseconds and that it's listening on, on this particular uh, port. And now I can just create Alice, create Joe, and retrieve Alice and Joe. And it just works, works normally, except it's really uh, in, a, in a native binary. It starts really fast. If you were interested, you can see how big the binary is. Yeah, like 59 megabytes. Well, yeah. It took about two minutes to, uh, to compile. Uh, it, and, but once you start it now, it really, it's, it's really, really, really very fast. Um, I wanted to show you metrics, but I suppose we're running out of time. I could show, I don't know, uh, let's, let's do questions. Are there any questions? Yes? Uh, keep the database running? No, you, uh, if, if I have to uh, keep the database running, no, I, I think I don't have to keep it running. No, uh, it will uh, it will scan the the the, uh, the the entities, the build the necessary meta model of the entities and stuff, but it will not execute any uh, any queries to the database. No. Well, it kind of runs, but not completely. It runs the, the stuff that are suitable for this, that, that can be serial, serialized into the resulting binary, but not, not more. Yes? Okay, two questions. Can you show us the LDD of the binary? The first one, and... Show you what? LDD. LDD? Uh, 
the question is if I can use uh, reactive drivers for databases, right? Yes, uh, we support some of them. Uh, let's just, let's have a look at the code workers I/O. You see that in the in the options that you can choose for your for your application, you see reactive MySQL client, client PostgreSQL client, small right reactive messaging with connectors to AMQP, Kafka, MQTT, and that's it. The, these, some of these things are in preview. This, they are not yet uh, considered stable, but you can use them already. Yes? Um, when you see the size of the draft and the size of the executable, there is quite a huge difference between the two. Is it uh, always that factor, or is it just because it's uh, so small uh, dummy application? Well, uh, the difference between the size of, of the jar and um, and the native binary, well, uh, the difference is mostly because the the, um, the native binary kind of contains all the necessary parts of the, of of, uh, of of JVM runtime, the necessary parts. Okay, so it's a, it's kind of a, a fixed uh, cost. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, well, it, it will always be a bit bigger, well, in this case, over 50 megabytes, yeah. It, it, all, it is bigger. That's okay, but if my draft is twice the size, I'm not yet twice the size of the MacMeet uh, if, if the If the jar that I have was not, the, the, this is the plain jar without dependencies, right? It's like six <laughs> kilobytes. If, if my application was more than six kilobytes jar, of course, this would not be 120 megabytes. Of course not. That there's, a, there's a fixed, uh, fixed cost that, that's added statically to it. Any more questions? Yes? If I, in dev mode, if I update the configuration, it will also reload, yes. It reloads on code changes, the configuration changes, uh, POM changes, and this is, um, it can reload on, uh, on more things de depending on the extensions that you use. An extension can declare that some particular file that's a specific configuration file for that extension should be watched for, for updates as well, for example. Yes? What about the memory? Uh, memory footprint of dev mode. Uh, it's obviously a bit more than if you just run it in regular JVM mode because there's there's the scaffolding in it and each reload means it basically discards the class loader that loaded the current version of the application, creates a new class loader and loads it again. Uh, so yeah, it will, the, the memory footprint will be higher in, the, in dev mode, yeah. But once you compile it into a, a jar or a native binary, you get rid of that. Yes? Of performance differences, uh, of course, uh, in, in native mode, it's of course faster because uh, we're not in, in a JVM anymore. We're not using uh, bytecode, we're using a heavily optimized na uh, na platform dependent code, so it, it usually should be faster in most cases, unless there's some kind of issue. If, if it's not faster, that's probably an issue that should be solved. Okay. I think we're out of time, so thank you everyone.